Good day and welcome to the City of Charlottetown Presents Podcast for Seniors. Today, Wendy Chappelle, experienced functional aging specialist and personal trainer, will be with us. And she has a demonstrated history working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry. So this should be a very interesting topic for all of us. Welcome, Wendy. What can you tell us about uh, uh, cognitive health and why it's important? Well, thank you for having me on today. Um, cognitive health is the ability to clearly think, learn, and remember. Um, so it's a really important component to brain health. Um, and there are other uh, components of brain health, like our motor skills and our emotional responses and our sensory skills. But our cognitive health, obviously, um, particularly as we age, is really important to our day-to-day -day interactions. So... Today and these days, we live much longer. Our lifespan has increased dramatically in the last um, 30 to 50 years. Um, but lifespan, if you don't have quality of life at the end, is probably not really useful. So we tend nowadays to think about health span. So how long am I going to be healthy, including cognitively healthy, so that as I age, I live in a way that has meaning and quality. Um, and so that cognitive health figures into that health span. What yeah. is resiliency in aging? So resiliency is um, in aging, it's defined, I'll, I'll read this, by the American Psychological Association as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threat, or significant sources of stress. So as much as resilience involves kind of bouncing back from difficult experiences, it's also uh, involved in profound personal growth. So it's not just the ability to survive a difficult experience, but it's also the ability to adapt and cope with circumstances in a way that um, enables us to emerge stronger, you know, to thrive in the aftermath and to integrate the lessons we've learned. Uh, what are the three characteristics of a high resilience in re in regards to aging? I'm saying so. Um, the impact of resilience on aging has some key characteristics. And the high resilience falls into three main categories. So they're mental, social, and physical. So the mental characteristics will include things such as adaptive coping skills, um, yes. gratitude, happiness, mental health and optimism and hopefulness. And then the social characteristics uh, include things, there's many things, but includes community involvement, contact with family and friends, and a sense of purpose and strong positive relationships. And then the physical characteristics center around the ability to remain physically independent and mobile and enjoying good health and believing that one is aging successfully. Why is sleep important to cognitive health? The sleep is one of those areas. I talk about sleep in presentation and with my clients in my classes because many people don't sleep well, but they don't always connect the importance of good quality sleep to good cognitive health. Um, and it's so important because, you know, historically we just thought of sleep as a time of rest. But sleep is actually a time when a lot of things are happening body and in our brain. Um, so the, sh the sleep becomes the foundation of our mental health and our physical health and all kinds of performance. Um, it will affect our immune system, our skin health, our ability to heal wounds, um, our memory, our clarity of thought, and our longevity. So when we're sleeping, um, new learning and memories are consolidated and waste products from, you know, living our lives are removed from the brain physically, right? Like absolutely literally happens. So mood is also modulated and cognitive functions are tended to while we sleep. Really important. Yeah, sleep is important to all of us. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can get on board with that. So what can, yeah. we, what can we do to improve our uh, sleep situation? Okay, so um, that question is a little more complex than it sometimes sounds. So I'm going to explain that um, over the course of like 24 hours, we have this 
Um, we have cycles of sleep and wakefulness. And what we do in each of those cycles will affect how we sleep, how often we sleep, the quality of our sleep. So how we wake up, in fact, affects how we sleep at night. So I'm going to talk about those three cycles a little bit and the tools or the things we can do within those cycles that will help with our sleep. So our first cycle is prior to waking up, it's about 4 a.m. And again, uh, these are generalities, obviously, but from around 4 a.m. to three to four hours after waking up is our first cycle. And then from that period, post waking up to about 6 p.m. in the evening is the second cycle. And then from about 6 p.m. till 4 a.m. in the morning is the third cycle. And what we do in each of those cycles does affect our sleep. So within that um, first cycle, that early morning cycle, when we're waking up or three to four hours before we wake up, um, those morning routines that we participate in, they kind of entrain our circadian rhythms, that 24-hour cycle. Um, So the mechanisms in our body will expect certain patterns in those that clock will be set. So so during the night as we sleep, one of the things that happens is that our body temperature decreases by one to three degrees. And it is triggered by all kinds of chemicals in our bodies, our cortisol. But as we reach that 4 a.m. roughly time, our body temperature begins to increase. It's a signal that we should be waking up as we warm up our body. And our cortisol begins to be produced and distributed through the body. So as we're waking up, we want to do the things that will encourage that body temperature increasing and the cortisol being released. So, um, so one of those things is light darkness. So being exposed to light early in the morning will help trigger the cortisol, which is our wakefulness, which seesaws with our melatonin production. So over the night, the melatonin begins to decrease and the cortisol begins to increase. Over the course of the day, the cortisol reaches a peak, begins to decrease the melatonin and begins to increase. Yes. So, um, so they play a seesaw kind of role. And so in the morning, light triggers the cortisol production. So we have actually solar sort of receptors in our eyes that aren't just meant for seeing. They're actually meant to just receive light and darkness so that they can tell our brain, the rest of our body, that this is the time of day when we should be waking up or getting ready for sleep. So exposing ourselves to bright light early in the morning you know, within you know, three to four hours within waking will help trigger all of the symptoms that then say in the evening, it's time to sleep. Kind of interesting. And those photoreceptors are actually located in our lower part of our retina. So overhead light, which the sun always is for us, but in our homes, overhead light will help trigger those. So if you can't get out into bright sunlight for 10 to 15 minutes in the morning, um, then turning on all the lights in your home will help trigger that wakefulness. And that wakefulness, of course, will help trigger sleepfulness later in the day. So that's one thing we can manipulate is the lights and how we're exposed to it. And, you know, like there's a lot of variability in this because everyone has different wake up and sleep times. And then there's complications related to, say, shift work, which I'm not going to talk about. There are ways of dealing with that, but Um, That gets a little more complicated. So bright light early in the day. You don't need to stare at the sun. You get sunlight even when it's cloudy. Um, You know, even England gets sunlight, even though it rains a lot. It's just just exposure early in the day. And then the other around body temperature. So our body temperature is warming up if we encourage that warm up. So it's not everyone's cup of tea, but um, having like doing, if you work out, if you do exercise, doing your exercise early will help increase your body temperature. And so that'll help increase the wakefulness, that'll help increase the cortisol production. And then at the end of the day, the opposite happens. So that's a good thing to do too. And then you also have other things like caffeine to help with wakefulness. Um, and, And I think that's about it for that morning cycle. And then, so you're just trying to increase your body temperature or or assist in that and increase your exposure to light early in the day. And then that triggers the patterns, the circadian rhythms for later. 
In the second part, which is, you know, about four, three to four hours post waking up to that early evening, 6 p.m., um, you know, there's just certain things you want to avoid later in the day, perhaps, like caffeine later in the day. I, I have friends, like maybe they'll hear this podcast. I have friends that go for dinner with some friends, and there's two of them that drink coffee at dinner in the evening. And I remember a long time ago saying to them, um, so does that bother your sleep? And one of them said, oh, I don't sleep well in any way. <laughs> um, <laughs> which came first, the chicken or the egg? So if you're not sleeping well, then you're not realizing that the caffeine is probably contributing to that, right? So you don't want to have caffeine later in the day. Um, if you nap, you just want to avoid late day naps. Naps are great, but you want to do them maybe early in the afternoon. And then again, um, we, we live in a world where most of us do our exercise, if we do it, post-work. So late in the day where we're increasing our body temperature late in the day. And that just seems to um, be the way you were structured socially. However, it does not do us favors in our sleep cycle. Um, so it, what it's doing is delaying that circadian sleep rhythm from triggering. So maybe adjusting your light so that your exercise doesn't necessarily happen late in the day. And then your last um, cycle is your third cycle. So from about six in the evening to that 4 a.m.-ish in the morning. So this will sound contradictory, but what you want to do is expose yourself to evening sunlight. (laughs) So that sounds contradictory because I said get out and get some sunlight early in the day to stimulate those photoreceptors in the lower retina to let the brain know that it's wake up time. But in the evening, those same photoreceptors are um, receiving different lengths of sunlight. You know, we are this wondrous machine that we don't really fathom. But so sunset light, in fact, triggers sleep circadian rhythm. So exposing yourself to sunlight, sunset, late in the day will help with triggering sleep. And then you want to lower your body temperature if you can, and that'll help. So I didn't say this for the first early part of the day, but lowering your body temperature is not the same as going into a cold shower because our body interprets these cues separately. So if I wanted to lower my body temperature late in the day, one of the things I could do would be to have a warm shower because what happens is my body determines that I'm getting too warm and begins to trigger, you know, the homeostatic systems that will decrease body temperature. So, and the opposite is true in the morning, right? So what I'm trying to uh, decrease my body temperature in the morning, I get in a cold shower, then my body, my brain, all my systems get that message of, oh, we better send out all of the stuff that warms us up because we're not supposed to be cold. So that sounds contradictory, but that's how it works. So that's one of the things. <laughs> you might want to sleep in a cool environment. So checking the temperature in your bedroom. And maybe layering blankets so that you can peel them off as opposed to using blankets for the warmth, you know, using the temperature of the room as being cool and having a very dark room. So ambient light in your room at night is very disruptive to sleep patterns. So whether that's your clock radio or you're taking a device into your room, um, greens avoid screens for a few hours before and never popular these days, everyone's has their, when I first realized that people were talking to me on their phones from their bed years ago, when I was like, you're still in bed and you're talking to me, like, put that phone away. Um, so, you know, it's pretty common that we do that now. Um, so avoiding screens, that light coming at us, blue light in the evening is not good. So those are the kinds of things that we can, the tools we can use. You might want to avoid alcohol late in the day. So alcohol, you know, has that, um, sort of that contradictory effect of um, making us sleepy, but it totally affects the quality of our sleep. So we get poor quality when we use alcohol to help. And you might use it periodically. Um, It tends to be the same with some of the like cannabis-related supplements. Um, Um, Typically will help you get to sleep, but you don't always have great quality of sleep. So there's sometimes chaos. So that was a loss, but... um, There's like the tools are really easy to manipulate. So you got light and dark, you got temperature, heat, 
So you can use exercise, you can use cold or hot showers, depending. You've got the, uh, sunlight, you've got darkening your room, you've got exercise to either increase your body heat or early in the day or avoid at the end of the day so that your body temperature can go down. So they're pretty straightforward. I mean, there's obviously supplements that you can use. I don't talk about those much or prescriptions as well. Um, so I'm not going to go into those, but, and then there's digital kinds of things. And I, I won't say a lot about those because, um, app, right? There's resting apps and there's, um, beautiful meditations, sleep meditations on YouTube and you can use those. You just need to be cautious about the screen and the light. So you can use some of those without having a screen on to get good sleep. Yes. Let's, <laughs> let's get, let's all get some sleep. Uh, why is exercise important to cognitive health? Yeah. So exercise is the biggest thing for your back, for cognitive health. It's kind of amazing. And people who are not exercisers or who, you know, were averse to it for some reason, never like to hear that. But the data is utterly convincing. There's reams and reams of good research indicating that exercise of various kinds um, increases our self-esteem, helps us be strong and resilient for as long as possible. So if you're not doing anything, do something. But if you're doing something, maybe do a little bit more. Depends. I spent a number of years attending a um, conference, which was all in neuroscience research. So it was a conference. It was first time research scientists, not for me, but I'm always interested. And it was on um, the kinds of research that people were doing around uh, treatment, you know, medications for cancer, but also for cognitive decline. So lots and lots of research out there on for um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, those kinds of diseases. And every time at each of those conferences, there was always a public event. So there was one research scientist who would do a kind of user-friendly um, presentation. And every year, tons of the public arrived at that, almost all of them with some vested interest in what do you do about cognitive decline. So many of them either with neurodegenerative diseases already or with loved ones with neurodegenerative diseases. So we would listen to this presentation. And then invariably, every year at the Q&A lineup, at the microphone, there would always be the first questions, question, third question would always be something like, my husband has Parkinson's disease and his tremors are really bad. And I'm wondering what you can tell me about the medications that would help him. So that kind of question or three members of my family have had Alzheimer's disease. I'm worried about getting it. What can I do to prevent it? 100% of the time, the answer was exercise. So research scientists who have funding grants, you know, for millions and millions and millions of dollars sometimes, who are doing important work, still knew that the best bang for the buck for prevention and treatment is exercise for our brain. So exercise, one of the things that it does primarily is it obviously pushes more oxygen to our brain. So it increases our blood flow when we get our heart rate up, and that brings more blood flow to the brain. And so more of the brain is getting a nutrition through, right, through the oxygen, and the vasculature of the brain is staying healthier. And so those are the two most important components of that exercise effect. But there's also clear um, research saying that developing greater muscle strength does the same thing because it's also improving the vasculature of the brain. So overall, it um, helps with all kinds of parts of our um, healthy brain. So um, cardiovascularly, like that aerobic exercise, if you're not moving, just move. That's all you have to do. And if you're already moving, move a little bit more. If you're not lifting weights, start lifting some weights. You know, I sometimes, I teach fitness classes to seniors. And I encourage them because, you know, when we step into an exercise program as a senior, and if we don't have a history, we just grab like a two or a three pound weight because we're afraid. 
mm. of lifting heavier weights. And I said, you know, I'm not training you to lift your coffee cup. You got to be stronger than lifting your coffee cup, right? Um, so exercise is really important. It, it increases um, the strength of our immune system and it um, helps to develop all, all kinds of endogenous chemicals, chemicals we uh, manufacture in our body that stimulate our immune system, that help keep our brain vasculature healthy, that, put, that um, help the function of the hippocampus, which is really essential in memory. So it's a great thing to do if you're not doing, just do a little bit. There's all kinds of user-friendly exercises also. But the statue. Why is our mindset and beliefs about aging important to cognitive health? Yeah, this is a really interesting area of research. Relatively new, right? So there is Dr. Becca Levi, who's written a book called Breaking the Aging Code. And her work is around uh, mostly mindset and beliefs. So um, our mindset or our beliefs about aging are really important. So our beliefs will shape our thinking, right? And our thinking will influence our behaviors. And our repeated thoughts are what shape our behavior. So that in turn affects our long-term health. So we stop to think about how do we think about aging? You know, I'm totally guilty of that. And, you know, as I've gotten older, um, I've become obviously more aware of just how negative generally we view aging. You know, I'm 65, but I can probably think of, you know, at the age of 40, making reference to, oh, that was a senior moment. Um, that's a negative thought, right? A mindset that, you know, as we age, our memory is going to be gone. You know, that's not necessarily the cheese. And the other thing I see quite a bit of um, on social media is relatively young people who just don't understand who talk about, like, um, so who, who, who told, who didn't tell me that? After the age of 29, my sore back was never going to get better, right? Like, and that's an indication of thinking about aging. So it permeates our society that as we age, we just really deteriorate. And when we believe that, we do. <laughs> so, so some of the things folks listening could reflect on is, are, when you think about, about old age, what comes to mind? So think about the, and maybe they're positive or maybe they're a mix. Um, and are they positive or negative? And where did you acquire these beliefs? Because they're really embedded in our society. So teasing them out is kind of an interesting thing. And would you like to improve your thoughts about aging? Because you can. There's actually really solid research that shows that. So um, I have two, I have a quote or two quotes maybe from Dr. Levi's research. She says, in her Yale lab, she's been able to improve people's memory performance, their gait, their walking, their balance, their speed, and even their will to live by activating positive age stereotypes for just 10 minutes. So she kind of, um, under the threshold of awareness, she flashes all these positive things about aging, and it totally improves, just 10 minutes, totally improves how they perform, how they walk, how they remember things. So, you know, I think sports has known for a long time that mindset is important in how you perform. But now applying it to how we think about ourselves as we get older is kind of the new cutting edge of that. So in one study that she participated in, middle-aged adults who held more positive beliefs about aging lived an average of 7.6 years longer than those who held more negative beliefs, even when controlling for other health factors. That's pretty amazing um, that you can do that. <laughs> yeah, so really important to start looking at how do you think about it. And I do believe there's someone currently on the island. Um, I think Dr. Olive Bryanton is beginning to collect some data around um, mindset in some of our older population here on the island. Why is hydration important to cognitive health? Yeah, so that's another thing, right? So hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, so we're mostly water, but physically our bodies and our brain. And water is, you know, conductive of electric um, impulses. And that's really what our brain is. 
is a series of electric chemical impulses. Yeah. So when we dehydrate, um, our cognition is highly effective and it doesn't take much. So, um, for that to happen. So with mild dehydration, like losing just 2% of your water, it can import, impair your cognitive performance, your attentiveness, your short-term memory, your decision-making ability. And then you might also have like dizziness, nausea, apathy, confusion. Um, so it affects our ability. Age affects our ability to stay hydrated. It's harder to stay hydrated as we age. And then it also affects our ability to recognize. So we kind of tend to lose some of our thirst or that acknowledgement. And I, um, as a personal note, I don't mind sharing this. So I care for my mother in my home. She lives with me. She's 91 and is in advanced stages of Alzheimer's dementia. And hydration has been one of our challenges um, for sure. And I can immediately notice when she hasn't had it. I can... So in her early stages of dementia, um, there would be this, like, all this time and this utter confusion, this inability to create a sentence, like all kinds of really physical. And then I would have to, you know, she's older and doesn't like to drink. Um, Lewis, she loses that, you know, desire. There isn't the trigger to say, oh, you're thirsty. Um, and so um, I would have to push it. And I talk to other people with quite elderly um, loved ones, they look after, and it's similar, right? You kind of have to stand in front of them. But dehydration shows up almost immediately in their cognitive functioning. It's pretty wild. And then another thing that I would add to that from a personal note, but I come across it commonly now too, is um, in our elderly, when we dehydrate, of course, that will affect the amount of urine we're producing. And it contributes to urinary tract infection in both men and women. They get more common as we age. And urinary tract infections can actually um, cause delirium, which look like dementia. So someone who gets dehydrated and gets a urinary tract infection can look like they have symptoms of dementia. It's wild. And it's kind of that's what started my mother's um, journey into dementia. And years ago, she had a UTI and a urinary tract infection. And it was low grade. So she didn't recognize it. She was 83 at the time, I think. She didn't recognize it. And her medical doctor didn't recognize it. And it sat in her body based on, you know, what I learned, probably about three months. And infection travels in our body. So it lodged in her brain. She thought she was having a stroke. It ends up that it was the delirium from the UTI. She was hospitalized. And my aunt is a personal care worker. And she said, um, no, that's not like a UTI. That's a stroke. Hmm. But in fact, it was a UTI. And then I started, so of course, it was the first time I came across this bit of information. I started researching and I started talking to people. So that's what I do. And lo and behold, there were a number of people, you know, on forums and message boards who had in fact um, placed their loved ones in long-term care. When it was just a UTI, but no one knew. And a local pharmacist, when I was chatting with her, she said, you know, if someone comes in and talks about a loved one who suddenly looks like they just like lost their mind, they can't, you know, remember what they had this morning, they can't remember names, they are totally confused. She said, the first thing I say is, have you had them tested for a UTI? It's really common. So I'll put that out as a PSA, public service announcement. Um, and it's related to dehydration, because if you stay hydrated, you're less likely to get a urinary tract infection as well. So totally connected to what's happening cognitively. That's not amazing. That blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Wendy, um, before we go, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered today? Yeah, there's so much, but I think that that's enough. You know, like try to do things in chewable chunks um, and... You know, when I get started on my stories, then you'll really be in trouble. And this will just go on for another 24 hours. So, so I'll just say, I'll say that that's enough for today. All right, for today. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for helping us out and giving us this great information. And uh, thank you for uh, being on our uh, episode. Great. I, I was really appreciate being here with you, Mike. Thanks.
You've been listening to Wendy Chappelle. She's an experienced functional aging specialist and personal trainer with a demonstrated history working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry. And she's given us a lot to think about. And that's it for this season. Thank you for listening to the City of Charlottetown Presents Podcast for Seniors. We hope you've enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.